We expected trouble from Pritz, but it failed to show up. Oren came out to the place, and with a couple of men Don Lewis loaned us and help from Cap and Tom, we put a house together. It was the second day, just after work finished, when we were setting around the fire that Oren told Tom Sunday he was going after the marshal's job. Sunday filled his cup with coffee. His mouth stiffened up a little, but he laughed. Well, why not? You'd make a good marshal, Oren, if you get the job. I figured you'd want it, Oren started to say. Then his words trailed off as Tom Sunday waved a hand. Forget it. The town needs somebody, and whoever gets it will do a job. If I don't get it, and you do, I'll lend a hand. I promise that. And if I get it, you can help me. Oren looked relieved, and I knew he was because he had been worried about it. Only Cap looked over his coffee cup at Tom and made no comment. And Cap was a knowing man. Nobody needed to be a fortune teller to see what was happening around town. Every night, there were drunken brawls in the street, and a man had been murdered near Elizabethtown. And there had been robberies near Cimarron. It was just a question how long folks would put up with it. Meanwhile, we, had, we went on working on the house. We got two rooms of it up and Orn and me set to making furniture for them. We finished the third room on the house and then Orn and me rode with Cap over to the Grant where we bought 50 head of young stuff and drove it back and through the gap where we branded the cattle and turned them loose. Working hard like we had, I'd not seen much of Drusilla, so I decided to ride over. And when I came up, Antonio Baca and Chico Cruz were standing at the gate, and I could see that Baca was on duty there. It was the first time I'd seen him since that night he tried to knife me on the trail. When I started to ride through the gate, he stopped me. What is it you want? To see Don Luis, I replied. He is not here. To see the senorita then. She does not wish to see you. And suddenly I was mad. Yet I knew he would like nothing better than to kill me. Also, I detected something in his manner. He was insolent. He was so sure of himself. Was it because of Chico Cruz? Or could it be that the dawn was growing old and Taurus could not be everywhere? Tell the senorita, I said, that I am here and she will see me. It is not necessary, his eyes taunted me. The senorita is not interested in you. Chico Cruz moved his shoulders from the wall and walked slowly over. I think, he said, you had better do as he says. There was no burned match trick to work on them. And anyway, I wasn't looking for a fight with any of Don Luis's people. The Don had troubles of his own without me adding to them. So I was about to write off when I heard her voice. Ty! She sounded so glad I felt a little jump inside me. Ty, why are you waiting out there? Come in. Only I didn't come in. I just sat on my horse and said, Senorita, is it all right if I call here at any time? But of course, Ty. She came to the gate and she saw Baca standing there with his rifle. Her eyes flashed. Antonio, put that rifle down. Mr. Sackett is our friend. He's, he is to come and go as he wishes. Do you understand? He turned slowly insolently away. Yeah, he said. I understand. But when he looked at me, his eyes were filled with hatred. And I glanced at Cruz, who lifted a hand in a careless gesture. When we were inside, she turned on me. Ty, why have you stayed away? Why haven't you been here to see us? Grandfather misses you. 
and he wanted to thank you for what you did for Juan Torres and for Miguel. They were my friends. And you're you're our friend. She looked up to me. She looked up at me, then took my hand and led me into another room, and rang a little bell. She had grown older, it seemed, in the short time since I had last seen her. She looked taller, more composed, and she was worried too. I could see that. How is Don Luis? She's not well. My grandfather was old and he's more than 70, you know. I do not even know how old, but surely more than that. And he finds it difficult to ride now. He fears trouble with your people. He has many friends among them, but most of them resent the size of the ranch. He wants only to keep it intact for me. It is yours. Do you remember Martin de Brew? Yes, of course. He's dead. Pete Romero found him dead last week, 10 miles from here. He'd been shot in the back by someone with a Sharps buffalo gun. That's too bad. He was a good man. We drank tea together, and she told me all that had been happening. Some days now, it was difficult for the Don to get out of bed, and Juan Torres was often across the ranch. Some of the men had become hard to handle and lazy. Apparently, what happened today was not the only such thing. And Don Lewis was losing his grip when he needed desperately to be strong. And his son, Drusilla's father, had long been dead. If there's any way that I can help, you just call on me. She looked down at her hands and said nothing at all. And I sort of felt guilty, although there was no reason why. There was nobody I loved so much as Drusilla. But I'd never talked of love to anybody and didn't know how to go about it. There's going to be trouble at Mora, I said. It would be well to keep your men away from there. I know, she paused. Does your brother see Senorita Pritz? Not lately, I paused, I'm uncertain of what to say. She seems older. So I told her about the place where we had found and thanked her for the help of the men the Don had sent to help us with the adobe bricks. And then I told her about Tom Sunday and Oren, and she listened thoughtfully. All the Mexicans were interested in the election of the marshal, for it was of great importance to everyone. His authority would be local, but there would be a chance he could move into the sheriff's job. And in any case, the selection of a man would mean a lot to the Mexicans who traded in Mora and who lived there, as many did. What I was saying wasn't at all what I wanted to say. I searched for the words I wanted, and, and they would not come. Drew, I said and suddenly, I wish. She waited, but all I could do was get red in the face and look at my hands. Finally, I got up angry with myself. I've got to be going. I said only, yes, can I come back? I mean, can I come to see you often? And she looked straight into my eyes and she said, yes, you can, Ty, I wish you would. And when I rode away, I was mad with myself for saying nothing more. This was the girl I wanted. I was no hand with women, but most likely, Drusilla considered me a man who knew a lot about women and figured if I had anything to say, that I'd say it. She had a right to think that for a man who won't speak his mind at a time like that is no man at all. More than likely, she would think, I just didn't want to say anything if she thought of me that way at all. That was a gloomy ride home. And had anybody been laying for me that night, I'd have been shot dead. I was that preoccupied. When I rode up to the house, I saw... Ollie's horse tied outside. Ollie was there, along with a man who operated a supply store in Mora. His name was Wilson. The time is now, Oren. You've got to come in and stay in town a few days. Charlie Smith and that sandy-haired man who was with him had done a lot to rile the folks around town, and they're mighty impressed the way 
Tyrell handled them. That was Tyrell, not me. They know that, but they say you're two of a kind, only... Ollie looked apologetically at me. They don't figure you're as mean as your brother. I mean, they like what happened out there, only they don't hold it to killing. Orrin glanced at him. There wasn't another thing Tyrell could have done, and mighty few who could have done what he did. I know that, and you know it. The fact remains that these folks want law enforced against killers, but without killing. The Mexicans, they understand the situation better than the Americans. They know that when a man takes a weapon in his hand, he isn't going to put it down if you hand him a bunch of roses. Men of violence only understand violence most times. Orrin rode into town, and for two days, I stayed by the place, working around. I cleared rocks using a couple of mules and a stone boat. I dragged the rocks off and piled them where they could be used later in building a stable. Next day, I rode into town, and it looked like I'd timed things dead right. There was quite a bunch gathered outside the store. Ollie was running, and Ollie was on the porch. And for the first time since he came out, he had a gun where you could see it. It's getting a decent person can't live in this uh, country, he was saying. What we need is a town marshal that will send these folks packing somebody we can trust to do the right thing. He paused, and there were murmurs of agreement. It seems to me this could be a fine, decent place to live. Most of the riffraff that caused the trouble came from Las Vegas. Across the way on the benches, I could see some of the settlement crowd loafing and watching. They weren't worried none. It seemed like it was a laughing matter with them, for they'd played top dog so long here and, and elsewhere. I went on into the saloon, and Tom Sunday was there. He glanced at me, looking sour. I'll buy a drink, I suggested, and I'll take it. He downed the one he had had, and the bartender filled our glasses for us. You sackets gang up on a man, Tom declared. Orr's has got half the town working for him. Take that Ollie Shattuck. I thought he was a friend of mine. He is, Tom. He likes you, only Ollie's sort of a cousin of ours, and he came from the same country back in the mountains. Ollie's been in politics all his life, Tom, and he's been wanting Orrin to have a try at it. Tom said nothing for a while, and then he said, if a man is going to get any place in politics, he has to have education. That won't help Warren a bit. He's been studying, Tom. Like that fool Prince girl, all she could see was Orrin. She never even looked at you or me. Women folks, they pay me no mind, Tom. They sure gave you all the attention in Santa Fe. That was different. He needed cheering up, so for the first time I told him, or anybody, of what happened that day. And he grinned in spite of himself. No wonder why well, that story would have been all over town within an hour, he chuckled. Orrin was quite put out. He tossed his drink. Well, if he can make it, more power to him. No matter. Tom, I said, the four of us should stick together. He shot me a hard glance and said, I always liked you, Ty, from the first day you rode up to the outfit. And from that day, I knew you were poison mean in a difficulty. He filled his glass and I wanted to tell him to quit, but he was not a man to take advice, and particularly from a younger man. Why don't you ride back with me, I suggested. Cap should be out there and we could talk it up a little. What are you trying to do? Get me out of town so Warren will have a clear field? Maybe I got a little red around the ears. I, I haven't thought of anything of the kind. Tom, you know me better than that. Only if you want that job, you'd better lay off the whiskey. When I want your advice, he said coolly, I'll ask for it. 
If you feel like it, I said, right out. I'm taking Ma out today. He glanced at me and then he said, give her my best regards, Ty. Tell her I hope she will be happy there. And, and he meant it too. Tom was a proud man, but he was a gentleman and a hard one to figure. I watched him standing there by the bar and remembered the nights around the campfire when he used to recite poetry and tell us stories from the works of Homer. It gave me a lost and lonely feeling to see trouble brewing between us. But pride and whiskey are a bad combination. And I figured it was the realization that he might not get the marshal's job that was bothering him. Come out, Tom. Ma will want to see you. We've talked of you so much. He turned abruptly. He walked out the door, leaving me standing there on the porch. He paused. Some of the settlement gang were gathered around, maybe six or eight of them. The Durango Kid and Billy Mullen right out in front. And the Durango Kid sort of figured himself as a gunman. More than anything, I wanted Tom Sunday to go home and sleep it off or ride out to our place. I knew he was on edge and in a surly mood, and Tom could be hard to get along with. Funny thing, Ollie had worked hard to prepare the groundwork all night, and Orrin had a talking way with people, and the gift of Blarney if a man ever had it. It was a funny thing, with all of that, it was Tom Sunday who elected Orrin to the marshal's job. He did it that day, there on the street. He did it right then, walking out of the door onto the porch. He was a proud and angry man, and he had a few drinks under him. And he walked right out, right out the door, and he faced the Durango kid. It might have been anybody. Most folks would have avoided him when he was like that. But the kid was hunting notches for his gun. He was a lean, narrow-shouldered man of 21 who had a reputation for having killed three or four men up Colorado Way. It was talked around town that he had rustled some cows and stolen a few horses. And in the settlement outfit, he was second only to Fetterson. Anything might have happened, and Tom Sunday might have been, might have gone by. But the Durango kid saw he'd been drinking and figured he had an edge. He didn't know Tom Sunday like I did. He wants to be Marshal Billy, the Durango kid said. He said it just loud enough. I'd like to see that. Tom Sunday faced him. And like I said, Tom was tall. And he was a handsome man. And drink it or not, he walked straight and he stood straight. Tom had been an officer in the army at one time. And that was how he looked now. If I become Marshal... He spoke coolly and distinctly. I shall begin by arresting you. I know you are a thief and a murderer. I shall arrest you for the murder of Martin Abreu. How Tom knew that, I don't know. But a man needed no more than to look at the kid's face to know. Tom had called it right. You're a liar, the kid yelled. He grabbed for his gun, and it cleared leather. But the Durango kid was dead when it cleared. The range was not over a dozen feet. And Tom Sunday, I'd, I'd never really seen him draw before, had three bullets into the kid with one rolling sound. And the kid was smashed back. He staggered against the water trough and fell, hitting the edge and fallen into the street. Billy Mullen turned sharply. He, he didn't reach for a gun. But Tom Sunday was a deadly man when drinking, and that sharp movement of Billy's cost him because Tom saw it out of the tail of his eye, and he turned and shot Billy in the belly. I'm not saying I, I might not have done the same thing. I don't, I don't think I would have. But a move like that, at a time like that, from a man known to be an enemy of Tom's and a friend of the kid, well, Tom shot him. The crowd across the street saw it. Ollie saw it. 
Tom Sunday killed the Durango Kid. And Billy Mullen was in bed for a couple of months. And it was never the same man again after that gunshot. But Tom Sunday shot himself right out of consideration as a possible marshal. The killing of the kid, well, they all know the kid had it coming. But the shooting of Billy Mullen, thief and everything that he was, was so offhand that it turned even Tom's friends against him. It shouldn't have. There probably wasn't a man across the street who mightn't have done the same thing. It was a friend of Tom's who turned his back on him that day and said, Let's talk to Orrin Sackett about his job. Tom Sunday heard it. And he thumbed shells into his gun. And he walked down the middle of the street toward the house where he'd been sharing with Orrin, Cap, and me when we were in Mora. And that night, Tom Sunday rode away. <laughs>